let's get some more analysis on this and bring in Matthew Bryza. He's the former U.S. ambassador to Azerbaijan and joins us, joins us now from Istanbul. Uh, Matt, good to see you. Always a pleasure having you on. How do you evaluate this, this statement coming out from the U.S. Embassy in Ankara? I think it's quite significant in that it shows that the United States really didn't want to have a fight here. Uh, I think probably uh, there was a, an underestimation of how, how the Turkish side would react. Uh, and um, I think it's useful that the United States uh, underscored the importance of the Geneva Convention, because that means the United States is acknowledging it's important to play by the rules of international diplomatic behavior. But I also think there's a, um, a, a hidden meaning in the citation of the Geneva Convention as well, because uh, that, that is what the United States government talks about with regard to um, uh, employees at U.S. diplomatic mission outposts here in Turkey who had been detained. So in a way, this could be uh, a very subtle way that Washington is saying, let's negotiate. Uh, we understand that it's inappropriate for us to seem like we're telling your courts what to do. <laughs> we over, maybe we overreached, but also maybe we can find a way to resolve the issue of our detained employees. So let me ask you the question that I asked Yusuf and I also asked Hassan. I mean, do you think this was a conscious decision uh, from the very beginning to actually come out with a statement like this? I mean, they must have known that this could have been uh, or will, would have been uh, interpreted as interference in internal affairs? Well, you know, based on my own experience, um, I, I could imagine that this was uh, a statement um, that seemed uh, like it was benign from the perspective of Washington. It was the U.S. ambassador uh, joining nine of his uh, transatlantic colleagues in expressing support not, not for any policy push by those embassies or those countries, but by the European Court of Human Rights, you know, saying its decision needs to be honored. I, I, I could see how something like that would seem anodyne inside the bureaucracy and then wouldn't be carried up to the highest level where the political level people need to balance all our various interests. So it, it, my instincts tell me it was simply a, a mistake in underestimating uh, how it would seem here in Turkey, at meaning an attempt to interfere in the internal affairs of Turkey. So they've come to the realization, and would you characterize this as perhaps a step back then? Yeah, or, or a recognition, you know, that, put it a different way, I don't, I don't think that necessarily the, the Secretary of State Blinken or President uh, Biden or National Security Advisor Sullivan, that they decided, you know what, Let, let's have a confrontation with Turkey on this issue. I think they probably just you know, felt that, well, it's the right, you know, let, if they even knew, they probably this thing just happened. And so now when it became such, a, such an intense uh, issue of dispute and at this moment where it seems Washington really does wish to work with Ankara to de-escalate the whole dispute about S-400s and F-35s by, by virtue of the F-16 potential sale that I think that Washington realized, my goodness, we, we, we don't we don't want to get to a point where our U.S. ambassador could be expelled, because then were that to happen, the Congress would never would never agree to any F-16 weapons sale to Turkey. And then U.S. Turkish relations would be in free fall. So I think from Washington's perspective, there, there's no pride involved here. I think it's pragmatism. You know, they they realize, oh, my goodness, uh, if we stuck to this hard line, which we really didn't intend. Uh, we're going to kill all of our opportunity to get Turkey-U.S. relations back on track. You mentioned a couple of these issues uh, that have been uh, a, a strain, a thorn on, on, on the side of both countries, the S-400, the F-35, the F-16, uh, northeast Syria or northwest Syria, uh, and Afghanistan as well. How do you expect relations to develop in the near future then? Yeah, well, I would also put on the list again, it's something that's obscure here in Turkey, but really means a lot for the State Department, which is those employees of U.S. diplomatic missions that had been detained. That, that for, you know, inside the Department of State and the National Security Council, that's sort of a litmus test. So assuming, you know, that issue can, can kind of be worked through, um, then I, I think uh, what really it all boils down to in the near term, sort of the cork in the bottle, is whether the F-16 sale will be, will be permitted by the Congress. If yes, then I think the de the, we've de-escalated, or Turkey and the U.S. will have de-escalated the um, F-35, S-400 dispute, not resolve it, but they'll have de-escalated it. And then 
the way will be open to talk about Northwest Syria, about how you know, in Idlib, uh, Turkey has actually been protecting civilians from Russian and Assad regime attacks, and maybe there's something to build on, build on there that could, over time, lead to some progress with regard to the U.S. not working with the YPG. I think that could clear the way as well for co cooperation in Afghanistan, where Turkey still has a diplomatic mission on the ground, which the U.S. does not, and where Turkey has offered to manage Kabul International Airport, which the U.S. needs. Um, so other things could happen, but it's it's too early to tell whether or not um, get you know de-escalating this current dispute uh, about the ten ambassadors will get us to an F-16 deal, and then we can get to those other things. Because the other point I wanted to make, um, if if the X F-16 deal is blocked by the U.S. Congress, then I fear we're back into really turbulent waters in Turkey-U.S. relations, and th and then the future is really unpredictable. Matthew Bryce, I always appreciate you coming on, and I do uh, appreciate Janosis. Thank you very much.